Hello, everybody. You're listening to Chatting with Candace. I'm your host, Candace Horback. Before we get started on this week's episode, if you want to support the podcast, you can go to chattingwithcandace.com and you can sign up for our Patreon account or you can click that little button that says buy me coffee. Both of those things help me to continue podcasting, improve the quality of the content, and hopefully start getting guests in for live podcasts. This week, I'm really excited to introduce Jonathan Stoll. I met Jonathan when he invited me to be a guest on his podcast, Soul Force One. I was super nervous. He's an academic. He's a director of career education at Oregon State University. We don't align politically at all. I wasn't really sure how the conversation was going to go. And he was so welcoming, so warm, and a great example of being civil and polite and getting along and being friends with someone who has different philosophies, ideologies, and just a views on where we should go as a people and as a country and as a culture. So I was really excited that he wanted to be on the podcast to continue our edge. Edit that out to continue our conversation about spirituality, its role in the education system, and his spiritual journey. So I hope you enjoy the conversation. Jonathan, we met obviously on your podcast. We had a really great conversation. I'm not going to lie. I was super nervous when you had me on just because I was like, these are academics and I'm just a regular person. Um, But you led the conversation in such a way that I just felt so welcome. So I was so excited to have you on. If you want to give the listeners a little bit of your background um, and I guess what you do for a living. Yeah, yeah. I'm excited to be here. And I think that's the the truth that we each have a story to tell. And so I was excited to have you. Um, And so it's it's definitely reciprocal um, and mutual. Uh, So I work at, at Oregon State University where I'm the director of career education. And I've worked in higher ed for about 20 years now. And I host a podcast called The Soul Force Ones. And I have a kind of nonprofit consulting business that we just started up uh, with another partner of mine called Soul Force Education. So I'm all about soul force. And to me, that's very spiritual. And it's obviously soulful. And it's in acknowledgement and trying to pay homage to the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King, who said we will meet uh, at the majestic heights, essentially meet physical suffering with soul source, soul force. Um, so, so for me, it's spiritual, it's soulful, and just trying to live up to that work in, in, in through purpose and defining meaning in whatever it is that I do. Yeah, I think that's so beautiful. So is that something that's relatively new or has that been a mission-driven force throughout your life? Because I find it so curious that you're in education at such a high level and then you also have such a big emphasis on spirituality because you don't really see that. Like You obviously see like your religion 101 classes um, and we'll touch there, but to actually like encompass spirituality as a part of your being and your narrative um, I think is so rare. So how did you get into that? Yeah, I think it's, I mean, in, in one way, you could probably say it's a lifetime in terms of how I've identified and how that's evolved, mm-hmm. right? From being raised Catholic to identifying as atheist and then agnostic, and now what I would consider animistic. And then, so that showed up really though in my work, probably just about a year, maybe two years ago, when I was doing community relations work and kind of responding to growing enrollment at the university and what, what they call town gown relations. And once that had improved and I, I, did, I wasn't finding meaning in the work because I think for, for in many parts, we had solved the problem to a certain degree. Now there's a whole nother problem, right? In terms of town gown issues with the pandemic and, and students and, and all of that. And I'm not in that position. And it became a matter of, well, this work isn't necessary. And I just began to think, think about how in public education, we talk a lot about identity, gender mm-hmm. identity, racial identity. And I think we should. And it was really fascinating to me that we didn't talk about spiritual identity, religious, secular, spiritual identity, and how we find meaning. And I didn't realize it, but there were a bunch of people already doing research and talking about this. 
um, Parker Palmer, who we're going to have on our podcast as well, who I consider the godfather of spiritual education in higher education. And at that time, I don't think you could say that because it was so controversial. I think there's an understanding that spiritual can be separate from religious Mm -hmm. and in a public education context in particular, where there is the separation of religion and state, and there should be. Mm -hmm. And I firmly agree with everything in our first amendment. Like that's, that's what makes the United States, the United States. That's Mm -hmm. what makes it great is the freedom of speech, freedom Mm -hmm. of the press, freedom of religion. So there's a difference between practice and do as you do and pushing something on other people. And I think there's a difference to share and learn and understand like, all right, you have a path. I'm, I'm interested in knowing about that path without this is the only path. You got to walk exactly where I'm walking right now. And I'm like, I'm not cool with that. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it's that universal truth and, mm-hmm. and the search of that. That's the journey. And I think that we do that together in conversation. And so I started asking people as I then kind of delved into some of that writing and that philosophy was, what is your faith? I would ask people that. And at first they were kind of like off put. Because usually it's just evangelical individuals who think you need to be saved, who are going to preach to you. And I'm like, no, I don't. I just want to hear your story. And you've, you found these really fascinating, intricate stories of people growing in multi, growing up in multi-faith uh, families and just the complexity, maybe growing up in a cult or like there's just I, I was watching the documentary on uh, HBO about what is it, Richard? You know what I'm talking about? Kiefer? I don't know. I thought I for a second I thought you were gonna talk about the Nexium thing because we touched on cults briefly and I was like, oh, we're gonna go there already. Mm-hmm. So do you find a lot of support by your colleagues with all this? Because I've never even heard of anyone taking this approach um, in university. I'm also in the, a completely different geological lo- location. Um, but to me, there's a, a lot of nuance. So are you getting a lot of support and a lot of interest from the students? Um, or are they like, ooh, no, like I don't really want to get into spirituality? 
Yeah, with the spirituality piece, I, I'll, I'll bring it in during a workshop. I just did a workshop with some, with some students uh, in the EOP TRIO program. So these are first generation college students. Mm-hmm. And, and I, I, I name it as, because it's really the podcast in a way. I think that's where I explore it the most. Mm-hmm. On campus, I'll bring it up in the sense that I'll talk about what are your values. I do name it to some degree because I have this same background on when when I'm in the when I'm in the classroom, so to speak, virtually mm-hmm. is is naming that this is spiritual to me, mm-hmm. and, and I don't know that it's a focal point just yet because mm-hmm. I just started on this like mm-hmm. in the last kind of four months, really, and in the job for a year trying to connect the dots. Like in many ways, I'm saying let's go back to kindergarten and connect the dots. Um, you do that a lot with language too, which I find so interesting. You're a bit like of a poet. So you were like, it's not about profits. It's about profits. It's um, the whole interview and then interview. So you definitely have like an appreciation for language, which I think is really neat. Um, well, it's meta. It's metaphor. Like yeah. I think we use metaphor to try to make sense of life, to make, to give it meaning, to help understand it. In uh, the Tao Te Ching, it says the eter- that which can be named is not the eternal name. Um, that the eternal Tao is as soon as you try to name it like God or, or Jesus or put a name on it, that you've lost sight of what it's all about because these are just words. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, to me, that's it's hip hop. And that's I, I take that as a huge compliment. So thank you. Um, and, and it's just at the end of the day, they are just words, too. Like it's the paradox that, yeah, you can find significant meaning in these words, but it's what's behind those words. It's how are those words expressed, right? Mm -hmm. I could say something really vile, call you a cucumber, and that has no meaning, (laughs) but I say, you fucking cucumber, right? Now that might mean something. (laughs) Totally. So um, you're also a dad, so I'm just curious. Do you, like, what's your take on bad words? Like, do you, some people say words are like magic and that they can kind of cast a spell in a sense. Um, and then other people say take the more Shakespearean route, which is like a rose by any other name is still a rose. So nothing has meaning unless you give it meaning. Um, so where do you fall in those two schools of thought? Yeah, that's an interesting question. We definitely try not to curse and, and share everything with our children. Um, but naming things for what they are. So if it's a penis and it's a vagina, then you use those words. Um, And I think that's a whole other thing because I have two girls as well. Mm -hmm. Um, But having conversations, talking about what's going on in the world, but then protecting them from certain images. And so I guess I kind of maybe think similar to words is, is I don't think you need to, at least for me, we don't expose them to curse words like Mm -hmm. fuck there's damn and there's things that slip out when we're Mm -hmm. upset and we're angry um but i think our our intent is to protect them from it and otherwise it's just talking and i'm i'm pleasantly surprised you hear this with your kids the words they pick up Mm -hmm. where they say something and sometimes you're you're proud in a sense (laughs) uh because wow they know that word that's a big word where the hell did you hear that and then other times you're like, oh, wow, I said that. Right? <laughs> they get the sass and the attitude. And you're like, oh, I know where that got, came from. Mm-hmm. Okay. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah, we don't know what approach we're going to take yet because I tend to fall with nothing has meaning unless the observer gives it meaning. Um, so it's like I enjoy curse words. Like, so, you know, sometimes there is no – substitution for the word fuck, right? Like there, there's nothing else that's going to satisfy you like that word. Um, and then it can be used in a funny way. It can be used in a sexual way. It can be used in an aggressive way. Like there's just like so many, you know what I mean? So it all comes down to like the person saying it and their intention behind it. So I don't know how you explain that to a little child that's learning words because obviously it's not socially appropriate for a five-year-old to go around screaming obscenities. So yeah, well – have to cross that bridge when we get there and that becomes the thing right i think in many ways why someone wouldn't want their kids to hear it because then they would be afraid that they would repeat that word in a social environment where then it reflects poorly now people are judging you right right as a parent um, but, but that's a that's something that you i think as a parent 
juggle all the time. And I think it's getting past that is to hell what other people think, Mm -hmm. right? Like I'm going to do me and what I think is best for my kid. Um, Sure, there are limitations to that, like everything. But generally speaking, I think that's one of the things that we as parents learn through this process. I like to think, you know, that my kids teach me a lot, particularly around patience. (laughs) Um, But but just those those and that's the same thing as I think with words, right, is is through career, through life, finding the meaning in different situations. And so being a parent, I think that's why some people, right, I don't think you realize it until you have kids that it's the most rewarding and yet challenging thing at the same time. Mm-hmm. That paradox. Mm-hmm. I think life is a paradox um, because how you approach it, right? You could also say that they're ruining your life. But if you approach it as this is an opportunity to learn and grow and to really share something and an experience a lifetime with another being, then it takes on a whole nother meaning. Mm-hmm. I couldn't agree more. There's, It's one of those things where there's become such a negative association with having children that you're give, making this massive sacrifice and you know giving up on this almost like utopia of your future. Um, but it's it's all in like your, I guess like your frame of thought, right? So you can have this beautiful opportunity that nothing, nothing can even compare to that, right? Like you created a life, and you're helping kind of craft someone, a human being, right? It's there's nothing else that's gonna gonna take place of over that. Um, and I don't find a lot, at least yeah, I don't find a lot of limitations, right? It's all in your mindset. So like if you someone if you're someone who's an avid traveler, I just had someone on the podcast. Um, his parents were they were nomads. So he, they took him and his siblings like everywhere. Like they sometimes slept in a car. So that was something that was very important for them as individuals. So they just brought their kids along for that ride. And it's you can't argue that that didn't shape that um individual later, right? So you can still pay homage to what's important to you and raise children. And um, I don't see it being like this huge sacrifice that everyone's talking about. Like obviously there are gives and takes and everything. There's always a trade-off, right? Um, But I think you can do it all. I don't don't think you have to pick, which I think a lot of times we're told, especially like as women, right? Like you can't have a family and be a career woman. Like you have to choose. And I, I mean, I do both and I love it. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's, it's the perception that the perception can imprison us. It can also set us free. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. And I think the thing with women, that's, that's real in terms of, I think women in particular have to struggle with that a lot more, maybe even just expectations that other women put on other women, but just the culture as well. And I think men obviously play a part in that as well in terms of the expectations at home. Right. And and are we sharing responsibilities and what does gender norms look like? What is and and I'm very mindful of that, having, again, two children about how because I think we. No, I don't know, in terms of relationships and and who we seek and how what we grow up with and the environment and what we see and what becomes normalized, how that sets our understanding of the world and our and our perception of it, because, yeah, I think it's tied to victimhood. There could be inequity, but as soon as I believe that I am the victim, like I've lost the battle. Right. And that's the, that's dangerous. a distinction between soul force and even hope or idle hope. Is like you look at the civil rights movement and Dr. Martin Luther King, and that was hope. That was soul force. It wasn't idle hope. Like people get it twisted. This idea of passivity or or active resistance they understand is passivity when it actually takes inner strength, like the courage, the resolve, the resiliency um, to rise up and to be stronger, to actually be nonviolent. It's so easy. And this happens with parenting to, mm-hmm. to lash out, like, cause you're, you're challenging my authority, who I am. Right. And to, and, and, and I'm not by any means perfect. Like I lose it with everyone else. It's mm-hmm. trying to remember like, no, that was cause you realize that after you go to sleep the next day, you're like, Oh wow, that was, that was my ego. Like, I let my mm-hmm. ego get involved. Like this is, it has to be love. Like this place at home, when my children come home, this has to be a place of love. If anywhere else in the world, when there's just so much chaos and, and violence, like this mm-hmm. has to be a safe place here. 100%. So I can't, I can't be doing that. Mm-hmm. So do you find a connection between 
I'll say like a quote unquote spiritual awakening and critical thinking. Yeah. I think it's interesting. There's this idea of being woke mm. and then the awakening, right? To, to wake up. Um, and, and it's almost to get past it's say some people may misinterpret this to get past race. It's not a, where I don't see black and white because you have to see it. You have to see the inequities that exist. But in terms of the human interaction, like I think that's what Black Lives Matter is. It's and, and people say this, they're like, yeah, all lives matter. And it's like, yes, all lives do matter. Your life matters. My life matters. I firmly believe that there's that of God within everyone. And we have to respect that of God within everyone. And that's a certain approach to a shared humanity that is very soulful and spiritual. And so that lends itself to not getting past the race and the gender, because that's a part of this construction of what we've created here on planet Earth. It exists. It's real. Somehow, like I've been thinking about in terms of a spiritual leader, like who we need, we need someone like a Desmond Tutu, a Dalai Lama. And we don't have that in either Trump or Biden. Mm hmm. At some point, I mean, I don't know how else we get past this without someone like a Dr. Martin Luther King, like a Gandhi. Like, is it possible that, and we, we have people like Dr. Cornell West, there are people, um, and it's not maybe we need one person, we just need more people who have this spiritual, this guide that, that well, connects us, that gets us past all of those labels. Right. I think the thing with spirituality, at least um, in the forms that I've seen, is it tries to ha have you identify the ego and then the pitfalls of that ego. And I think I think that a lot of people that are quote unquote woke, right, like that now has like a, a negative um, association with it because somehow it got derailed and now whatever it evolved to be is not what I think it intended to be. Um. You have and that's to, like a lot of symbolism, like a flag too, right? The American flag has become now a conservative thing that has a negative connotation in certain circles, like the term woke. In certain circles, woke is like, yeah, I'm woke. Other circles, like you're pointing to, look at it like, yeah, that's like that crazy left-wing bullshit, right? Well, to me, anyone that has an issue with the American flag, I think that they probably haven't been exposed to enough other enough cultures and enough um, a different way of living for the majority of the world, right? Like we, I don't care where you were born in this country. Like if you were born in the United States, you do have a leg up compared to the majority of everyone else in the world, right? Like we, yeah. there's very few people starving in this country compared to the rest of the world. Like it just it is almost one of those things that's on life support. So even the poorest American, right? Still, I would say, has a lot more opportunity than if you were born like that in India, for example. Um, so it's not to say that we're perfect, right? Like there's always room for improvement, but I think that we need to stop like hating our country. I think that's where hate never solves anything, right? So I just I don't understand the dis the disdain for America in general. And they're like, oh my gosh, there's a flag. That person must be alt right and whatever. I'm like, that's not <laughs> that's not what the flag means, right? It, right, it becomes maybe. a symbol and we we make it and define it in term and it's recognizing that the way that I see that flag and how I interpret it doesn't necessarily need, need to mean the interpretation from that other person. Like totally. there's different associations like you as a, a, a somebody who voted for Trump, like mm -hmm. people immediately associate that with racism. So I may not agree with that decision, totally. but I can't associate what I think of that person and the meaning that I derive from that individual and apply it to you because that's symbolism like that flag it is a symbol Car mm -hmm. george carlin said you know i leave the symbol to the symbol minded and to some degree i i agree with that i also disagree with it in the sense that symbols have powers so if somebody puts uh, a, a burning cross up in front of my house or mm -hmm. across there's a difference right if you put it in front of the street right in front of somebody's house and it means intimidation like it can mean different things right versus it was actually legal for 
people, and I think it still is, like if me and my buddies want to go down into a rural part of Oregon and burn a cross, while there's social implications to that, it doesn't necessarily incite the same intimidation, perhaps, right? Mm -hmm. So there, there's complexity to it. And I think that's where I like living is in the gray. Everyone gets caught up in this is black and white. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, yeah, there's some black and there's some white, but the, the beauty to me is in the gray. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think going back to the whole um, spiritual awakening, awakening and identity, again, is it's to detach yourself from ego. We, like you are not your ego and you are not these things that um, you identify yourself as. I think so many people don't do enough inner work to really know who they are. They allow everyone else to tell them who they are. So for example, like me being a woman, right? Like that's a he, that's an identifier. So just because I'm a woman, I was expected to, let's say, vote for Hillary, you know, four years ago. Um, that doesn't matter to me, right? Like, yes, I'm a woman. Like this is, you know, this is real in this reality that we're in. But just because we share the same gender – and the same sex, then I'm autom automatically supposed to think and act and behave in a certain way and support this other woman. I don't know, you know, I don't know anything about her, or maybe I know everything about her, and I just like disagree. So I think we have to like take ourselves away from those things that we've been told to identify as, whether it's like race or gender or your religion or especially ideologies, like that's where we get into trouble and realize like you are not those things. So I think a lot of what I see today is people are just honing in on these immutable factors, right? Like I can't change my race. I can't change my gender. Well, I can change my gender, but I can't change my sex. So no matter what these things are going, they're just going to be. So I know I'm going off into a bit of a tangent, but – the point is kind of to do enough work and find yourself spiritually or through religion or whatever you have and detach from ego and then realize that these immutable characteristics don't define you, right? Like just because you're black, that doesn't mean anything about you. That doesn't mean you're a good person or a bad person. That doesn't mean that you're nice or you're you're mean. Like I don't know what your beliefs are. I don't know what's important to you. I don't know what your values are, whatever. So there's so much more than – these identifiers. So I think we need to stop putting them on a pedestal and it goes back to like how do we kind of fix this? How do we get unified again? And it's by stop by stopping putting a magnifying glass on the things that divide us, right? So I think when it comes to being colorblind or going past race, it's not to say that your culture doesn't matter. It's not to say that your values don't matter, but it's to say that hopefully one day in the future, like you're not going to be like, oh, how many redheads are working at this company? Because you're like, why does that matter? That doesn't say anything about that group of people. So it's to hopefully get to a place where that doesn't matter because it's no longer something that's we're allowing it to define people, if that makes sense. Yeah, I, I agree. And that we can't make any generalizations about the black person, about the woman. Mm-hmm. And at the same time, we can almost with certainty say that that black man has had a particular experience in this country, that that woman has experienced some form of sexism. So naming the fact that we are, I agree with everything you say, and then we are products of our environment. There's a reason why people in California, by and large, are not voting for Trump and they're voting for Biden and people by and large in a particular community, right? Because we are products of our environment. So mm -hmm. as much as what you said is true, it's also true that these external factors, even though they are outside of us, have a considerable influence on how we think and how we process and how we experience this world and how we interact with one another. I think so too. And I think... <sighs> It's so tricky because you just I try not to like turn people off because it's like as soon as you identify a certain belief system, you automatically alienate this other group right. of people. Which See, and that's what I'm trying to like for me, I don't identify as Muslim, but there's a lot that I appreciate about Sufism and the five percenters. And so I want to read more about it and I want to pray five times a day. Like not 
in a ritualistic sense of this is how you pray, but I want to carve out five times out of my day where I meditate. I do me what the way that I connect to God, the way that I understand God to me. And I'm not really concerned if you call God a law or you don't call God, God, and God is in music and God is in the trees, whatever it is that gets you connected to a higher power. Because I think that higher power is that same higher power that is within us. Um, the people get all confused with heaven being up there and hell down there. Uh, the five percenters in this Wu-Tang series that I was watching, um, they're in the park and they're saying that heaven is what you go through. Hell is what you go through to create heaven right here. And I thought that was beautiful. So I think if you get to the root of all of these spiritual texts and, and philosophies and religions, at the end of the day, it's about that connection, that universal truth, that self of knowledge, that soul force ones. So do you think that there's a difference between religion and spirituality or do you think that oh, yeah. a different name? Yeah. So how would you, yeah. how would you define the difference? So I, I appreciate um, there's, there's a group in higher ed where they really kind of focused on religious, secular, and spiritual meaning making. Um, for me, religion is the system. It's the structure. It's that, that body, that conglomerate that facilitates that. And I think there can be absolute value in that. And I, I support that. Um, and then there's, there's spiritual, which I think, again, you can find in that organized body. I think there's a lot of people who find that even in non-theism and, and you can be an atheist and be spiritual um, and, or have secular meaning, right? It almost it is what you want it to be. That's the thing. Like I, I can't prescribe it. I can tell you how I understand and explain it to me, mm -hmm. but it can be metaphysical. It's not exclusive of science. To me, it's all connected, right? Like you mm -hmm. can believe in the big bang and believe in a higher purpose. Like those aren't mutually exclusive. hundred percent. Yeah. I find that we're in a place now where Science and spirituality are starting to become more and more obviously tied to, to one another instead of opposing forces, which it yeah. has kind of historical, historically always been. So that's going to be really fascinating to see with exponential growth in those areas like quantum computing and AI. And it's, I just can't yeah. wait. It, it, it's, I can't wait in a sense. And it's also fucking frightening. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and like what makes us human, you know, when you have people who have relationships with their, their, their systems, their devices, right? Um, like the documentary or that film, Her. And that's real. Like there's people who have relationships with their operating system yeah. and they will, you know, go to the movies and listen to their significant other. And that person is, a, or that algorithm or whatever it is, is evolving. You're evolving. You have this relationship. It's so complicated with career skills i talk about like it's our human skills it's it's how we connect with one another and with artificial intelligence automation the loss of jobs the the tre tremendous level of suffering in terms of our meaning is often associated with our work well if we don't have work then who mm -hmm. are we as people right i think there's going to be some like, existential questions about what makes us human especially mm -hmm. when we have relationships with artificial beings. It, it's sci-fi. It's here. Mm -hmm. COVID has just accentuated that. It's been coming, but we well, have just sped up this process, I think, like maybe several years. Right, and I think it's really important. I think if you are over-identifying with your job or your career, that that's like a very um, dangerous zone to be in. I catch myself there all of the time. So again, I find that you're going to find more gratitude and a more positive outlook on life if you detach these things from your ego, right? Like you're, you're not your job. Especially for me, that's been like an important conversation because I've had so many people who judge me based off of, you know, doing porn that they automatically think that they know everything there is to know about me. And it's like, I'm not a porn star. Like that's something I, I did. That was a job. Like that's not who I am. That's, you know what I mean? So well, and I appreciated when we talked about that and you explained your meaning mm -hmm. in terms of even why you do something like people can consume your product or what you put out there in different ways. Cause I was thinking, you know, you shared how, uh, 
couples can use this and it can be very therapeutic and there could be good that comes out of your work. Right. And then afterwards I was thinking, I was like, yeah, and there could be like a 15 year old kid who just masturbates to it. Right. And, right. and both can be true. Mm -hmm. um, but why are you doing it? I think that matters. Like the intent, like where your heart is, the purpose that you find out of something that that could still be meaningful. And then you can move on and there could be other parts of your life that are not defined by your work. And I think people can be defined by their work if they find tremendous value. Like you think of individuals like Mother Teresa or, or Gandhi or Jesus or these people, or if I build homes and, and if I pour my heart into it, like, right? If I find desire well, and, and fulfillment out of that, then it's, it's okay to, I think, get lost in it to some degree. Well, I think then you have to dig into, into more of the things behind what you could call like maybe the symptom, right? So like, if you find if you're defining yourself by building homes, what happens if you become quadriplegic? Are you no longer yourself, right? Like, is right. so you have to right. you have to say what's important about that, right? Like, so there's obviously um, a generosity there that's helping fulfill you, and that's amazing. So look into that. Like, what that just means yes. that you're this um, very like a giving person. So that's what you are. You're a giving person. You're not the home builder. So it's to say, yeah, you can be Mother Teresa, right? But it's not the job. It's more of like the acts. It's the the meaning behind those things. Um, so I think it's important to separate the actual like job title versus the underlying meaning behind that. So with that said, how would you say that you talk about spirituality and finding your career or purpose? Yeah, so what you did there was a little bit of math. So we talked about connecting the dots in kindergarten. Mm -hmm. You got to the math part of it, which is the common denominator. It's kind of reducing the numerator, finding that common denominator. And that is in career education, the transferable skills. Okay. That's what every employer is looking for. And it's taking that experience and finding that meaning and communicating that. And giving that other person on the other side of that table an understanding of how they did this over there, they accomplished this, they could do this over here. And, mm -hmm. and how you find meaning and fulfillment out of that, that generosity that you named. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's a part of the purpose is figuring out what matters to you, right? What do you find meaning? It's pretty simple. You hear it everywhere in our language. Like It's not rocket science. Like We know this. But it's so easy, just like we talk about parenting, like we know what we're doing is wrong, but you just get lost in the moment mm -hmm. and you lose yourself. And I think it's the same thing in a sense with career is it's very easy to get attracted to the celebrity. And you've experienced that, right? You mm -hmm. live in that um, to get past that. And I think as someone... I get caught up in it too, as someone who's aspiring for that in some way, right? Mm -hmm. Through the podcasting and through the things that I'm doing, you, I want people to hear me and be exposed because I think I have something that could provide them with some level of direction maybe, or to essentially find the answers within them. Because I think we have the answers. We just don't write, ask the right questions. We get caught up in all the answers that we see out there. And, maybe, and so I think I too can get caught up in this ego, this aspiration for something. And it's to be mindful of what matters. Like what at the end of the day is the purpose? What am I finding meaning? Because you can get caught up in that to what your point. If you have a tragic accident and you can't do this anymore, mm -hmm. what is it about that that you were trying to do? What, what was the goal? And to not lose sight of it, that money, yes. And money's not evil in the sense that it can open up doors. Mm -hmm. But if... And what's the intent? KRS-One talks about the difference between the rapper and the MC and the rapper being corporate. The rapper still has value. It's not to completely diss the rapper, but the MC is beholden to a code in hip hop that is rooted in values and discipline. And there's a beauty in that as well that I personally appreciate and I think aspire to, to be hip hop. Again, it depends on what you understand hip hop to mean because hip hop can be very spiritual there's going back to science there's science research that indicates that when an mc is in the flow they're in a meditative state mm -hmm. there's parts of their brain they're igniting the same way that you would because to 
come up and I'm not an MC. Like, like <laughs> I call myself MC Stoll, but that's, you know, just the, I'm not an MC. Um, <laughs> I might aspire to be, but I, I think I hold that term in such high revere that I, that I, to be an E-M-C-E-E. I might be an MC, but I think there's a difference in terms of the lyrical content. But that to be in that moment, I think in many ways is to lose oneself, to be one with the mic. The artist becomes one with the pen um, mm -hmm. or one with the paintbrush, right? When a basketball player is on fire, um, the net gets bigger. The net didn't get bigger, right? It's just mm -hmm. that everything goes in. If you're on a free throw line, as soon as you're in your head, that's when you miss the free throw. When you're in rhythm, right? That's why they practice free throw so much so that you, you're in rhythm. It's just second nature. As soon as you start thinking about that task, mm -hmm. you don't perform it as well as when you've lost yourself in that mm -hmm. task. So you touched a little bit on money and I'm so excited because I wanted to get there with you. So there's a lot of misalignment when it comes to being financially successful in the spiritual world, or it's almost like frowned upon. It's like two of this world and shallow and it, it doesn't align with a lot of people's like altruism. So I find that a lot of spiritual people tend to get in their own way when it comes to career success because they feel like that will deplete their spiritual success. Um, I've actually talked to this with a, one of my girlfriends um, who's a very spiritual person and was like, well, like what if I want the Range Rover? Like does that mean – like I'm a bad person. I'm like, no, like you worked your ass off. You started this company. It's when you start defining yourself by these things and you start putting too much value on these things. So it's how do you look at money? So for me, money is freedom. You, It buys you time. It buys you more time with your family. Um, if you look at it as a status thing, you're like, well, I'm better then. I think that's where you're going to do trouble. So it's kind of like redefining your relationship with money. So do you see that? Yeah, yeah. For me, with the podcasting, because we're we're just getting started, so we don't have a bunch of followers. And I think initially, because I love the process of the podcasting and being in conversation with other people, that's the fun. Mm -hmm. And then there's this part of me that has been struggling, that gets disappointed that John, you're putting out all this great content. You're ta talking to all these amazing people. There's not more people listening to you because then that becomes access to money, right? Mm -hmm. you, you get more listeners. You're reaching more people. Um, you get the opportunity for advertising. Now you can make money. Now you can maybe leave the job that you're in, even though you love it. Mm -hmm. You have the entrepreneurship and the flexibility over here to focus just on that. Mm -hmm. And so to get lost in that, to get lost in the aspiration of money, of the success, of the fame, perhaps, of the influence, it's real tricky because it's, it's almost tied to that as well in terms of the success of the podcast and then getting caught up in what is required of that in terms of cutting out segments of your video, creating graphics, the marketing piece of it, which mm -hmm. isn't as fulfilling for me, mm -hmm. but it becomes the conduit to the success, to these other goals that you want. And so what are you doing with your time? Because you only have so much of it, mm -hmm. that being the most precious resource. How am I investing in it? So I get caught up in that. Yeah. Of, of, I would ask the friend is, why do you want the Range Rover? It's not as if you shouldn't buy the Range Rover. I think that just becomes a matter of, well, why? And exactly. If, once you've answered that question and you've made meaning out of that purchase, very similar to the meaning that you make out of the car, then you're good. Like That's the only person you have to talk to, right? Some people might say, God's the only one who's going to judge me. At the end of the day, it's you. You're the only person you have to answer to. Mm -hmm. um, if you're feeling that guilt, Maybe it is right for you to feel like it. Maybe it's not. That's only, you know, depending on what you're doing. In the purchase of a car, probably you're the only one. But yeah, you, I think that comes down to the individual and where they are. Again, it's that perception. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I think so too. I just see, I see so many people that are, um, Stephen Kotler says, if there's a performance issue, then there's a spiritual, spiritual solution. If there's a spiritual issue, then there's a performance solution. So it's to say that these things can kind of coexist, right? So you can be like this, you know, mega CEO and wildly financially successful and also very spiritual. And you shouldn't feel guilty for that. I think if anything, in, whether you believe in God or the universe or um, whatever external force, I would say that that's just a tangible sign that you're doing something right for a lot of people, right? Like it's, it's not easy to make a podcast work, for example. So let's say your podcast all of a sudden is like top 10 in the US and you're constantly in those charts. That's a tangible sign that you're doing something right because that's not easy. Um, so I kind of look at money as the same way. And again, it's just to make sure that you have like a healthy relationship with it, which I think a lot of people don't. So I had yeah, like- I mean, you could, you could make your money in all kinds of shady ways mm -hmm. or righteous ways. Mm -hmm. And you can spend your money in all kinds of, righteous ways or shady ways mm -hmm. i think with purpose right there's a lot of students who think that they have to get into government work or nonprofit work in order to have to do to do good mm -hmm. and for me i want more people who have a ideology of which we've described in terms of this soul force oneness spiritual being this connection to other people in corporate america and in other places um because if you're principled and you have value then you can change places right so to money it becomes i think because people i think there's people who've made a lot of money and they might be really shady in terms of how they came up on that money mm -hmm. in terms of white collar crime street crime uh that to me, it does matter where your money came from. Like, were mm -hmm. you principled? And, and how did you deal with people and interact with people? Did you treat them with respect? Like, mm -hmm. that's where the value in the money comes. That's mm -hmm. that, you know, difference between cash money and what we like to call making cash, as in community, activism, authenticity, soul force, hip hop, the significance of healing, right? Like, in the process of making that money, did you create harm? Did you do evil or, or, or wrong to somebody? Mm -hmm. um, how did that other person feel through that transaction of someone giving you that money, right? So for me, I feel like if the podcast blows up, hopefully it's because it was, and, and the same with yours, rooted in principles of, of love and compassion and the discovery of truth through conversation with other people. Your students that feel the draw to go into the nonprofit sector or, or government. I think there's another hang up there when it comes to um, money and capitalism. I mean, you can't really name a sector where the private, um, the private sector doesn't excel over public services, right? So I think that the reason that some of these CEOs, I mean, they get you know, hung up to dry because of some of their salaries. But the, at the end of the day, you're paying for that person's like creativity and the effect that they're going to have on that corporation. So I want the most brilliant mind running, um, you know, like let's say SpaceX, right? Like I want, I, I want like a lot of money there that's going to help further humanity, um, whether it's something like Red Cross. I want someone really smart there so that they can have the biggest impact on the most people. Um, so if you get someone whose salary, and let's say you're going to pay him a hundred grand a year, I mean that's not a lot in this country, right? Um, it's still more than most, but it's not. You're not going to get the same mind as someone who's getting that five hundred thousand dollars salary. So I think absolutely go into the private sector, make a huge difference there, because again, like I don't find, I don't find any area that the private sector doesn't outperform um, the public sector. So I think you can do both. I think you can be financially successful and make a huge impact and it doesn't necessarily have to be a nonprofit because a lot of the thing that's trending right now is a corp b right so these companies that have a, do a double bottom line so they have like you know their performance goals 
for profit, obviously, but they also have goals as far as what they give back to the community and whatever way that they're doing it. Um, so I think you can have a much larger impact doing something like that and going to maybe a regular corporation, converting it to a Corp B, and maybe you you know deliver meals for every Hello Fresh that someone buys, whatever company, you know, whatever it is. Um, and there's all these other ways to impact the community in a positive way, and you don't have to necessarily not make money to do so. Yeah. I think I think the social responsibility factor, I think it's more difficult for a corporation uh, because you're driven by the pursuit of profit. Like it's it's designed that way. So mm-hmm. a Wells Fargo can invest money into the community. They can do some great block parties and bring people together. But then when you're leading to I mean, there's there's shady practices that happen as well. I, my mind was going to Keystone Pipeline. And that's very political, I know, in terms mm-hmm. of my ideology and what I think is right for the environment and things of that nature. Mm-hmm. Um, the social responsibility piece is important. I think I get caught up in, I agree with you in terms of the value. People get caught up on, you know, a university president, for example, because they could be making fi- half a million dollars. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and folks will say that's too much money. And to your point, I think they could go work as a CEO in a private company and make four or five times as much as that because they have that mind that have that, they have that skill set that is valued. So you can't just dismiss uh, supply and demand in terms of the value that our economy might place on people. The thing that I get caught up on is then the divide, though, because it's not just Elon Musk. It's all the scientists and the people. Right. There's an organization like mm-hmm. He's great as a hype man, and I'm sure he does more than just hyping things up, right? But he's he's a celebrity figure in many ways. Like, he's the face of that company, and mm-hmm. it leads to donors and investments. And mm-hmm. if he says something out of pocket, it leads to the retraction of that as well. So there's there's a lot of people, though, that are behind that organization. And I'm sure they're getting way, well paid as well. Mm-hmm. Um, they don't need John advocating for them. I'm sure they're pulling just enough money as a scientist or researcher. 100%. Um, it's, you know, to me, I think Andrew Yang said a lot of important things in terms of automation and how truck drivers and accountants and all kinds of people that have found value in their work get, get beyond just purpose and meaning, but to where we value their labor, right? Mm-hmm. We will no longer value their labor very soon. Mm-hmm. We have machines that are making salads and it's automated. We Mm -hmm. need less people to interact with. Mm -hmm. And so if there's less people that we're interacting with and it's all artificial intelligence, again, what makes us human? And then how do we value other people then? Because if I don't need you to do this or that because a robot will do do that, do I value you as an individual then? Because again, so many people see us within our roles. You're a porn star. That's the only value you have to this world. Mm -hmm. And so I think so little of you, right? Mm -hmm. As opposed to you're a human being, you have gifts, you have talents that go beyond what you were doing in this capacity, right? Mm -hmm. As a truck driver, as an accountant. um, I forgot the the example that you brought up earlier in terms, oh, we were talking about building houses, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Again, some of those skills, we're, we're going to continue to require people, but there's a huge level of automation, you know, 50% of the jobs that will exist 10 years from now don't currently exist. Like Mm -hmm. that's, it's Moore's law. Like things are happening very rapidly. And I think we need to pay more attention to that, particularly in terms of how we process and interact with one another and with the world. Yeah. Jack Ma did a conference with Elon Musk and they had kind of opposing views on the future of automation and AI's role in, I guess, taking jobs away. So Jack Ma was, who's tends to have more of a spiritual approach, um, was explaining that there's certain things that a computer is never going to be able to do that a human can do, right? So like the arts are a great example. Like people want to see, touch, and feel something that was made by a human. There's just like a, a transfer of energy there. What if you don't uh, know, though? What if a artificial intelligence could get to the point where they could produce art and we wouldn't know if it's human? Like, I feel like there's films. Like, do we need actors? Like, are, will we get to a point where we don't need porn stars? Because we can have an Eva that is 
animated and produced and can do those things? Well, I guess it depends on where your belief system falls, though. So if you believe in, well, I mean, this isn't even spiritual, right? Like this is just this is just physics is everything has a vibrational volume, if you will, or metric. So like, let's say, let's sure. say this is a hundred and let's say, you know, a dog is, I think a dog is like 250 or something like that. Um, a human being on average is around 200, depending on that person's like spiritual level and vibrational level. So like they can okay. be higher. So everything vibrates at a different level. I think that there's a transfer of energy when it comes to, let's say, cooking, I think is a good example. And we always have that phrase, like, made with love. I mm -hmm. firmly believe if someone that cared about you or really cared about the art of, of cooking made you a dish next to a robot that made the exact same thing, let's say, like, because this already exists. We have robots that are cooking. They make the exact same thing. I think you would be able to, to tell the difference. And I don't know because I've never done like a blind blindfolded um, experiment, but I think that there's a transfer of energy and intention in certain things that just won't be the same. I think we can tell the difference between a desk that was, you know, mass made on a conveyor belt versus someone who put like a lot of craftsmanship into it. I think we could. How many of us, and I don't think I could, are it i think you have to be in such in tune with the creation of that desk the creation of that food to where you can feel that love perhaps but when you think about let's use a video for example um if if there's two animated figures that are having sex they're obviously not real if let's say because there's this filter of the video like we we experience the world through video so Right, I can't taste some food through video, but I can see something. Mm -hmm. But am I certain that what I'm seeing, because I can't see those vibrations, I can't feel those vibrations through the video. It filters that out, right? So I would disagree I with that. Know, oh, really? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I think I think when you're let's say you're doing something with sales and you're communicating with customers like via email or um social media or what have you. I think that some part of the explanation between why some – and you can use my industry as an example – like why some girls do better than others, I think a lot of that has to do with that said transfer of energy. So I think when okay. one girl writes a caption or if one – so you know you can even take like voice out of, out of the picture and video out of the picture, like even down to just text. I think that that girl's intention and authenticity behind said caption or message – is going to be different based off of the individual and certain ones are going to align different with the consumer. So I think that is one small fraction that can kind of explain like why certain girls do better than others or why people can sell better than others. So I think that there's still that's still there. Yeah. I know it's probably a little hippie, but No, no, no. I, I appreciate that. Um as you were saying that, I was wondering, yeah, can there be a bestseller written by a robot? Like, what would that look like? Right. Would we as humans consume that? I guess my sense is that what if artificial intelligence, right? We, we laugh sometimes that Facebook knows us better than we know ourselves, right? Because mm -hmm. it picks up on our habits. Could artificial intelligence get to the point where they know us as a consumer so well, better than we know ourselves, particularly because you know, this conversation about ego, if we've lost ourselves, if we're so consumed by an ego, could a robot artificial intelligence theoretically know that and then know how to, you know, tip off those endorphins to get us to purchase something? Like to some degree, you can say that they've already done that through the algorithms, through mm -hmm. Amazon, through knowing what will peak our interests, mm -hmm. um, that, they, that they know and could potentially know us better than we know ourselves even with everything that you said still being true that few of us because i don't think i'm there but in terms of feeling that energy right because i think that's, that that may suggest a certain level of enlightenment to be able to be in tune with another being to the extent that you can taste the love in the cooking mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say that that just comes with like a ton of introspection and a lot of work and 
again, like detachment of ego, I think all of those steps are a good way to get there. But even when you talk about um, – what do they call it? Is it like the neuromatrix? Am I using the right word? Quantum matrix? Quantum matrix. I'm going to have to fact okay. check that. But it's essentially um, – It goes into like our energy is all connected in this giant map that we can't see through electromagnetic energy. Um, So again, it's just – it's there and if you pay attention, like you can feel it. Like there's there's healing exercises that you can do. I think it's a Joe Dispenza meditation, I want to say, where you picture like your heart, your heart chakra and, you know, that color, it vibrates at the color green. And you envision like that kind of growing and expanding, you know, your house and then your neighborhood and then your state and then your country and then slowly it engulfs like the world. And you can use this um, to create a connection or or to maintain a connection if there's like a loved one that's sick or, um, you know, maybe you guys are distanced for whatever reason to like maintain that connection. So a lot of people do it if there's like trauma in like the birthing process, for example. Um, or even if there's not trauma, even if you just want to like create that connection from the mother to the baby and let's say you're you're distanced for whatever reason. Um, so like exercises like this can help you start to like, I guess, fine tune into other people's energy and start to feel these things. Mm-hmm. I'm probably going to yeah. lose a lot of people with that. <laughs> no, and, and that, to me, right, you may have lost me to some degree in the sense that I don't know all of that. On one level, I want to believe that's true. Everything that you're describing sounds beautiful. It's, it's the interconnection. For me, it's the interconnection of words, the interconnection of energy. It's the interconnection of our planet, right? If you, if you one of our elders was telling a little girl, was like, hey, this is just dirt, right? Like, yeah, it's just dirt. But the complexity of the root systems and everything that, it, the connectivity there. Well, we lost Jonathan, <laughs> so you can listen to his podcast. It's Soul Force One. I'll have everything in the show notes. Um, thanks for listening. As always, it's been great to talk to you, Candice. Thank you so much for having me on. For those of your listeners who enjoyed this conversation, I'd highly encourage them to check out our conversation together on our Soul Force Ones podcast. And that's available at soulforceones.com and wherever you listen to podcasts. Additionally, as I mentioned, season two is sponsored by the letter P. So we talk to you, a porn star, a pastor, a politician, a university president, and other people in positions with P about their purpose. A sort of remix to spiritual and career development. So check us out. Thanks again. It's been really fun as always, Candice. Take care and be well. Peace.